Welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church. Some of you are present here in the church, some are on the phone, and some are online via the website. Welcome to all of you. As the calendar rolls over to September, the Michigan weather conveniently turns from summer to fall. I know fall is officially a little way off, but it seems like fall to me. Today, enjoy the fall weather and the rest of your Labor Day weekend. Here are the week's announcements, especially for our phone attendees. Our joint Bible study with Hazel Park First will resume on Wednesday, September 8th at 6 p.m. on Zoom. It'll run for four weeks. Join Pastor Horn as he teaches on the book of 2 Corinthians. Watch your email for the invitation and the lessons. Everyone is welcome. Join us for Thursday's virtual coffee hour. This is like the old meet in the parlor on Sunday morning and chat. Watch for the invitation to the meeting in your email, click on the link and join the conversation. First timers must download this, the app by go to, go to gotomeeting.com and following the instructions. Our opening hymn is number 64, Holy, Holy, Holy. <laughs> Please join me in the call to worship. Loving Christ, you are our gentle shepherd. Your will and to live in your way. Keep us safe and secure in your compassionate hands. As you lead and guide us, teach our hearts and our lives filled with joy. So that our spirits may be refreshed and our lives filled with joy 
and praise. At this time, we've come to the portion of our service where we can go to the Lord in prayer. We'll begin with a moment of silence during which you may call out the names of your loved ones who are standing in the need of prayer. And then after you've called out the names, we'll begin to pray. Let us bow our heads for a moment of silence. We praise you, O oh God, for your goodness, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, because we know that you listen to our prayers. You are such a holy and magnificent God, and yet you long to hear from us. So today we bring our requests before you. We know that you see us and know us, and we boldly ask you to heal us, help us, and forgive us. In praying, O oh God, we admit that we are in need of you, that you alone control all things. Respond to our requests. Allow us to feel your presence and reassure us that you hold each of us in your hands. We trust you, O oh God. Dear Lord, we know that there's so much brokenness in this world. We see so much uncertainty, despair, hopelessness, and sorrow. Sometimes we feel paralyzed by all that is out of order in this world. But we refuse to give up. We refuse to stop believing that truth and goodness and love will prevail. So give us strength to keep going and endurance to preserve. Let us know that you are always with us and may that assurance give us the confidence to be strong. Let us mourn with those who mourn, but let us also be people of hope, holding out faith that you are still present and active and your kingdom is still in our midst. We pray for all those who have been affected by Hurricane Ida Oh God, we pray, oh God, that you would bring healing and restoration, that everyone would feel your loving arms comforting them in the midst of all that they're facing and all that they've been through. Oh God, we pray for a safe and enjoyable Labor Day weekend. We ask these prayers in the precious name of Christ, and we give you thanks. In Christ's name I pray. And all God's people say amen and amen.
Our scripture lesson today is John 11, 1 through 13, and 38 through 44. <clears throat> A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happens for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But the disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus was simply sleeping. But Jesus meant Lazarus had died. John eleven thirty eight through 44. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sisters, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here, so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. The word of God for the people of God. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. I am Pastor Maurice Horn, and I serve as the pastor here at St. Paul United Methodist Church. Looking at the passage of scripture that was read today, for a subject I would like to use, Jesus comes when you need him. At this point of the scriptures, Jesus was near his, the end of his three-year earthly journey. This event takes place not long before the crucifixion. As a matter of fact, this event was set the stage for the plotting of Jesus' death on the cross. The Bible tells us that Lazarus, there was a man named Lazarus in the city of Bethany, and he was very sick. And Lazarus was somebody who had a close relationship with Jesus. Jesus loved him dearly. And his sister's name was Mary and Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the feet of Jesus in chapter 12 of St. John. The sisters had sent a message to Jesus to let them know that their brother, whom Jesus loved very dearly, was very sick. You notice they didn't ask Jesus to come because they knew this was unnecessary. They knew that once Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick, Jesus would automatically come. When you care for someone and you hear of the need of your presence, then you'll make it your business to go and see about them. But when Jesus said, heard about the sickness, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God. Jesus knew that this miracle would be 
a, a, a part that would help them to come up against him leading toward his crucifixion. He knew that when he raised Lazarus from the dead, the religious leaders would surely be out to kill him for sure. But that's why Jesus came to this earth to be crucified for the sins of the world and then to arise from the grave. When Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick, he intentionally remained two extra days where he was at. And after the two days went by, Jesus told his disciple, let us go into Judea again. His disciples reminded him, you know, Lord, the last time we was there, we barely escaped with our lives. So the Jews wanted to stone you. But because it was not Jesus' time, Jesus was able to slip away. The disciples asked him, and now you want to go there again? Jesus tell them that Lazarus is asleep and he's going to awaken him. Now the disciples thought that Lazarus was just asleep and that he was going to get better. But Jesus had to let them know, Lazarus is dead. He said that he was glad that he was not there to heal the sickness, but for the disciples' sake, that they might believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I believe at this point the disciples were afraid to go with Jesus, but one of the disciples named Thomas, the one that somehow or another got the name Doubton Thomas after the resurrection of Jesus, he was the one that had courage, and he said, let us go that we all may die there. Everyone began to say, yes, we'll go and we'll die with Jesus. You can count on us. Now, the Jewish custom when death occurred was much different than what it is today. Back in those days when a person died, they couldn't embalm them because embalming did not exist back then. Therefore, the body had to be prepared and placed in the tomb as quick as possible before the decaying process began to take place. The funeral would usually take place within 24 hours of death. Once the body was placed in the tomb, then they would return to the home and have a big meal that was prepared by the friends of the family. There would be seven days of deep mourning. During those seven days, it was forbidden to work. After the seven days of deep mourning, then it was followed with 30 days of lighter mourning. So by the time Jesus got there, it was about the fourth day of deep mourning. It was a Jew sacred duty to come and express loving sympathy with the sorrowing friends and relatives of those who have died. During deep mourning, it was a loud cry, historically wailing and screaming going on. They will call out the name of the deceased and begin to call out all the good deeds that they have done. Jews believe the more unrestrained the weeping, the more honored it paid to the dead. So in other words, by the time Jesus arrived, they began to mourn for Lazarus. They all began to cry out, oh, Lazarus, Lazarus was a good man. Lazarus was a good brother. Lazarus was a good friend. Lazarus was someone who loved God. And they just began to lay out all the details of Lazarus' life. And as they would call out these things and they would reminisce about all that Lazarus did, it would bring more sorrow to their heart. So by the time Jesus got there, the house was crowded with sympathizers. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she ran outside to see Jesus because she knew once everybody realized that Jesus was in the house, she was not going to be able to have any kind of private time with Jesus. Then Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, Martha was asking Jesus, why didn't you come when you get the news, got the news that my brother was sick? She said, if you had got here on time, you could have healed my brother, and he would not have died. Then Martha said some very powerful words. She said, but even now, although my brother is dead, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection of life. He that believeth in me, though he was dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. 
Do you believe this, Martha? Martha said, yes. I believe that you are the Son of God who shall come into this world. By that time, Mary, the sister of Martha, came to Jesus and fell at his feet, and she said, Lord, if you hadn't been here, my brother would not have died. She said somewhat the same thing her sister Martha was saying. Jesus, she said, why didn't you come and heal my brother Lazarus? I thought you loved him dearly. You know that he loved you dearly, Jesus. Then the scripture said, Jesus wept. That's the shortest sentence in the entire Bible. But why did Jesus weep? Some say that Jesus wept because he was upset that they had little faith. But I don't believe that was the case. I believe that Jesus wept because he could feel the pain that Martha and Mary was experiencing. I believe that Jesus wept because he seen the sorrow that was in the room. And one thing about when you can feel the pain of others, you begin to experience it yourself. You begin to have compassion and reach out. I believe that's why Jesus wept, because so many of his friends were hurting. Even though Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, Martha and Mary didn't know it. Whenever Jesus get ready to perform a miracle, he do what the Lord tell him to do. Jesus asked him, he said, where you put his body? Martha said, come and I'll show you. As they was walking toward the cave, there was a large crowd of people following them. Somebody in the background began to speak some negative gossip. They began to say, look how much Jesus loved Lazarus. But if he could heal so many people, open up the blind eyes, he could have prevented Lazarus from dying. They began to say all this negative stuff in the background. Jesus began to get a little angry as he listened to the, the negativity that was going in the background about why didn't he heal Lazarus before he died. Then finally they came to the cave and Jesus told Mary, take away the stone. Martha didn't understand why Jesus wanted the stone moved away. She figured that Jesus wanted to see his face one more time. She said, Lord, Lazarus has been dead four days, and his body's decaying. By now, his body really stinks. Jesus told her to roll that stone away. He said, I told you if you believe that you will see the glory of God. So then they took the stone away from the tomb. And Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and began to pray. He said, Father, I thank you that you've heard my prayers. He says, I know you always hear me. He said, but because of the people that surround me, I said that they might believe that thou hast sent me. Now, I want you just to use your imagination. Lab has been dead four days. The decaying process has taken place. Can you imagine when they moved the stone away? In that temperature in Palestine, sometimes the temperature would be 80, 90, 100, or even higher. All that hot weather, and a person is dead, and the decaying process has already taken place. You can imagine when he rolled that stone away, everybody said, Aah! because it smelled so bad. It said, then Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Now, he didn't holler and scream. He didn't say with a loud voice, Lazarus, to make sure Lazarus could hear him, because Lazarus was dead. He wanted to make sure everybody who was standing around him could hear what he was calling out, Lazarus. Now, let me explain a picture to you. You got to remember, Lazarus been dead for four days. His body began to decay. He was thinking maggots had began to crawl all through his corpse. And in the midst of the decaying process, all of a sudden, it came to a halt. Maggots began to disappear. Flesh that had left his body due to the decaying process began to reappear. And the breath of life 
entered into Lazarus' body. After four days of being dead, Lazarus come alive again. There was no question whether Lazarus was dead or if he was in a coma. Everybody knew Lazarus was dead. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is considered one of the greatest miracles that Jesus did during his earthly ministry. The only miracle that was greater than raising Lazarus from the dead was, is when Jesus arose from the dead. When Jesus raised the boy that was, that was having a funeral procession, when he raised him from the dead as he watched his mother in so much sorrow, the boy had only been dead for just a very short while, maybe a day, and he raised him from the dead. When Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, she had only been dead for hours when Jesus raised her. But in both cases, both of those that was raised from the dead, they was raised immediately after death. People could have said the boy and Jairus' daughter was never really dead. They was only in a deep sleep. But when he raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus had been dead for four days. There was no question that Lazarus was dead. His body had begun to decay. Now let me explain the decaying process so you can actually see exactly what took place. When the, the, the decaying process takes place immediately after death, when your heart stops beating and the blood is no longer flowing through your body and oxygen is not, no longer going through your body, then the body has no way of getting oxygen or removing waste. Excess carbon dioxide cause the membranes in the cells to rupture. The membranes release enzymes that begin eating the cells from the inside out. The internal organs begin to decompose. The heart, the liver, the kidneys, pancreas, the lungs, bladder, the stomach, the intestines, all of that begin to decay. Rigor Morris began to cause the muscles to stiffen and the body began to swell, and it began to smell horribly. When Jesus told them to move the stone, Mary understood that by four days, her brother had to be spanking. But Jesus said, remove the stone and called him out. And the moment he called him out, I want you to imagine how the decaying process went in reverse. The maggots began to disappear. The heart began to pump blood. The internal organs that had begun to decay began to come back to life again. Oxygen began to manifest itself within the body of Lazarus again. And then all of a sudden, after Jesus had called him out, Lazarus come hopping out in his grave clothes. Hopping out because he heard the body of Jesus. It's amazing. God can do anything. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, put the reverse on the decaying process. And then after he come out, Jesus says, unbind him from his grave clothes so that he may be set free. And they called the clothes he was buried in, grave clothes. And they cut him, unbound him, took everything loose so he can be free again. You can imagine at that moment when Lazarus came out, you didn't, the people couldn't tell if they should be happy, if they should be scared, or if they should take off running. After four days of being dead, that's something really amazing to see the dead who was thinking. When he moved the stone away, it was thinking. Now he then came back to life again. When God set people free, God set them free. And God set Lazarus free by the power of Jesus Christ working, manifesting the working powers of the Father. And Lazarus was free. They say that once Lazarus was set free, tradition said that he never had a big smile again because he knew he was going to die again. You know, it's amazing when God set us free, 
It's amazing and necessary for the church to be there to unbind them from their grave clothes so they can get on with their lives. When people get out of jail, they need the church to be there to help them to get back on their feet. When people get out of drugs and alcohol, they need the church to be there to help them. When people are trying to put their lives back together after a painful divorce, after a financial breakdown, after losing everything, the church is there to be the hands of Jesus to help them get back on their feet. Sometimes we think God is too late, but as I heard one songwriter say, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. We don't have an answer for everything that happens in life, but we have to keep trusting in God. I'm going to close by telling you a story of three men. They were talking about when they die. And as people come through their body, what they want to hear people say. First man was a doctor. He said, when people walk past my casket, I want to hear them say that he was a great doctor, that he made a great contribution to society to help us to be able to live a much longer life. The other person was a teacher. He said, when they walk past my casket, I want them to be able to say he made a great contribution to life, teaching people how to read, how to write, how to better their life through education. The third person was a factory worker. He said, when they walk past my casket, I want them to shout out, hey, he's moving, he's alive. We talking about Jesus, come when you need him. Amen. God bless. The giving of our tithes and offerings. There are four ways you can give to this ministry. You can place your offering in the plate as you enter or leave the sanctuary. You can give by text. You can click on the Donate Now button on our website, spumc.net, St. Paul United Methodist Church.net, or mail your check directly to the church. Please join me in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We give with joy into our kingdom today. May you bless our offering. Come, O Lord, and work through these gifts. Extend your love through us, we pray. Amen.
At this time, we will prepare our hearts to receive the elements of communion. I begin by reading the great thanksgiving. I will read the light print, and I ask that you would read the bold. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray over the elements of communion. And at the end of the prayer, we will pray together the Lord's Prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we can boldly come before the throne of grace, O oh God, to receive the elements of communion. We realize we don't deserve this, but by your grace and mercy, you allow it, and we give you thanks. We pray, God, as we receive the elements of communion, that we will feel your power, your love, your mercy, and your grace, O oh God. And then after we receive it, O oh God, then we may extend it unto others. We love you for this, and we thank you. May you change it from its natural state to the spiritual, that we would always be mindful of the finished work on Calvary. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Though we are many, yet we can become one by the broken body of Jesus Christ. The body of Christ is broken for you. Though we have sinned, yet we can be forgiven for our sin because the blood of Christ was shed for you. Have everyone received communion when they entered in the sanctuary? If you have not received communion and would like communion, raise your hand and communion will be brought to you. Is there anyone that needs communion? The communion table in the United Methodist Church is open to everyone. Communion is a means of grace that would allow us to feel the presence of God, the power of God, the love of God, and the mercies of God and the forgiveness of God. If you want to receive forgiveness, then I invite you to participate in receiving communion. If you would pick up your communion cup and begin to rub the very tip of it where you can get to the film that's covering the wafer and pull it back. You can pull back the wafer, lift the wafer from the cup, the body of Christ was broken for you. Everyone received the body of Christ. If you roll back from the tip of it again, and you can peel back the covering that covers the grape juice in the communion container. The body, the blood of Christ was shed for you. Everybody received the blood of Christ.
Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we again thank you for this wonderful opportunity as we receive the elements of communion. May we ever be more like you that every day we might show the world that we are a disciple of Christ so they can see Christ within our life. We love you and give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And in our closing song, Jesus Loves Me. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You are dismissed. Go in peace. Now.